Good morning. How you guys doing this morning? Let's come before the Lord and ask his blessing this morning. Thank you, Father. Lord, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we are so grateful to be here this morning, to be, Lord, in your care and, Father, under your protection. We believe, Lord, that you have a purpose for us this day. And, Lord, we know that part of that is to draw near to you. And, Lord, our prayer, Father, let your Holy Spirit breathe life into our hearts and our minds. Father, into this assembly as we gather in your name. Reveal yourself here today. And, Lord, as we worship you this morning, let your Holy Spirit just draw us to you and prepare our hearts and our minds, Lord, for all that you desire to do in this, this conference this morning. Father, we love you. Lift our families to you. We pray, Father, make of us those witnesses of Christ that you'd have us be. We love you, Father. We thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to the Simple Truths Conference. Um, the Bible, can you trust it? We're grateful to be here and thank you for turning out. And we want to take opportunity to welcome our brother Joseph Tata, the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? That's good. Let's all stand together. Sing this out with me. Let's make it our prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your prayer. sing that again. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. We sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is worth out with me. She is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cries. You lay down your life. That I might be separate. you done for me.
who breaks the power of sin and darkness who breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth who shakes the whole earth Amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I might be separate. The lamb, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. No, that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross.
Sick of my sin, my cross, my shame Rising again, I bless your name You are my all and all When I fall down, you pick me up When I fall down, you pick me up When I am dry, you fill my cup You are my all and all Jesus, let me go
let your name the morning breaks in glory let your name creation sings your story let your name let your name nations will bow Earth will rejoice, you people cry out. We will sing, Lord of all the earth, we will shout your name, shout your name, healing up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we let you shout your name, oh Lord. Lord of all the earth. Come to this place and fill the 
Jesus, you tell us to ask. You tell us to seek and you tell us to knock. Lord, and you tell us that the Father desires to offer good things to his children. And Lord, we thank you for the things that we have been blessed by. We thank you for salvation, Lord, for the righteousness of Jesus being placed on our account. God, we thank you for the hope that we have, Lord, the hope that is alive and it's real and it can't be taken away by the things of this earth. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for the work of the Spirit in our lives leads us into truth. He testifies to our hearts of who you are, Jesus. Brings us joy and hope. He breaks the bondages of sin. Holy Spirit, we need you this morning. And we know you desire to come. So let's sing this again. Let's just open up, our, our, lift our voices and our hands and just ask him to come and abide in this place. Abide in our hearts together. We sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what hearts long for. To be overwhelmed by your presence, Lord.
our voice together. All the earth will shout your praise. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will say, Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will say, Father, it is, uh, Lord, the reason we breathe is because you have given us breath. Lord, the reason we sing is because you have, have given us voices to sing. The reason we lift our hands, Lord, is because you have made us. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. And Jesus, we thank you that you are who your word says you are. Lord, we thank you that we can stand on the rock of your word. Jesus, I thank you that you, you have given us your word. Lord, that, that, that clarity in the midst of a, a dark and murky world. Lord, you have given us your word, that lamp to our feet, that light to our path, so that we can discern between the truth and the lies. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. And God, I pray that uh, today, Lord, we would incline our ears to what you have to say. Lord, I pray that we would recognize that that is one of the sweetest types of worship, not just the lifting of our voices and our hands, but, Lord, the inclining of our ears and our hearts to you. Lord, I pray that we would worship like that right now. I pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Maybe may be seated. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Pasadena. We are uh, having our Simple Truth Conference. We have it once a year. Usually for the men, we concentrate on them. But uh, at times, topics come up that we want to make sure that everybody's included. This is one of them. Uh, there is such, a, such an attack upon the, um, the Word of God today from different avenues. But the most basic and foundational one is that God's Word is inerrant and infallible. And we pray that as uh, Doc Johnson comes and shares with you these three sessions, I will finish up the last one, that you will walk out with a clarity of mind and a confidence in the scriptures, not us. Your confidence should never be in your pastor or your church. Your heart should be sold out to them, but your confidence is in Jesus Christ and his word, that you can check everything by the word of God. And today there's such an attack 
And uh, some of you may even be here that you're part of that and you don't even know it. Much of the emergent church is at the head of this watering down of the word of God. One of the basic tenets of the emergent church is you cannot learn any objective truth from the Bible. My Lord, are you kidding me? Why are we exhorted and commanded to study, to examine, to make judgments, to obey? We don't dialogue here. We study the word of God. We walk out with absolute certainty of the truth that God has given to us through his revelation. Not one jot, not one tittle will fail from the law, Jesus said. Jesus never implied that we'll see any, any error in any of the scriptures. And of course, he's talking about only the Old Testament, but we're going to see that even the New Testament is called scripture. There should be no argument about that. And so we, our prayer is again to just um, give you some background. There's some resources in the back. We're not here to merchandise you. As you will see the prices, we're not here to merchandise you. We're here to equip you. Two books are very important back there, The Battle for the Bible and the one that Paul Smith, uh, Pastor Chuck Smith's uh, brother that he wrote on the New evangel evangelicals or Evangelicalism, which takes you through the history of the liberal progressive movement in the Christian church that began right down here in Fuller Seminary, okay? It'll show you all the transition, all that's taking place and where we're at. You need to be a good student of history, what's happening in the church. The reason our country's in the shape it's in because we've cut off the youth from the history of America. So they have believed the lie. The same thing's happening in the church. People are being cut off from the history of the scriptures and what is biblical. So they're being deceived. And you need to understand that. Now, let me say up front, we are not the only ones. I don't have the Elijah complex. I know there are faithful men out there. I just don't know where they're at or who they are. But I know one thing, it's not many. The majority is always wrong with the people of God. Study your Bible. The majority is always wrong. What's the plumb line? The plumb line is the word of God. Not Xavier Reese, not anybody else, but the word of God. And so we, we just been praying for you guys and just encouraged that God's gonna do a great work in your hearts that you uh, are just uh, built up in his, uh, in his word and his strength. And um, so I want to bring Doc Johnson. Doc Johnson has been with us. Um, I go back and I do a conference back in Kansas, Olathe, Kansas, every year. have done it for the past 15, 18 years, I believe, something like that. And, um, um, and, and, and I met Doc down there, and um, uh, God's given them some uh, insight into the scriptures, and uh, we're all anointed and called for different ministries, and and he has a, a certain canny ability to be able to put these things in very simple forms. Uh, it comes across so we can understand them. And uh, he's been fellowshipping there about 10 years. And so um, uh, as we were thinking about putting it together, um, the Lord just kind of just led me to him. And I just came back from doing the conference back there in August. And so um, we, uh, we are just um, blessed to have him. But before I bring him up, let me... The tickets for lunch, if you want, after the first session, you can get them from front office. And Colorado, if you park there, it's only two hours parking. And if you know Pasadena, there's a guy around the corner with the stopwatch, okay? So uh, if you're parking in Colorado, it's only two hours parking, okay? So if you need to after the first service, just go out there and move it. You'll have plenty of time. There's a break here. At, um, we'll go to um, at 10.30. There'll be a break for 15 minutes you have more than sufficient time to move it, okay? So why don't you um, welcome uh, Doc Johnson and his wife is right here with us too also. Why don't you welcome them? Good morning. notes here and we'll get started. I uh, grew up in Kansas and um, decided to start studying the scriptures and um, went to several different denominations 
and realize that some of the denominations teach different things, which was interesting to me. Basically, we all teach the same thing uh, as far as the basic gospel is concerned, but there are little differences between the denominations. And I wanted to find out for myself what uh, the answers would be. Maybe they're important, maybe they're not, but I still wanted to know. And so I studied uh, Wesley and Luther and all those guys and found out that they were eloquent speakers, but they still disagreed with each other and never really proved some of those points. So if you have a background in computers, you'll kind of understand this. Let's create a code uh, that fixes the problem. Let's just start at the beginning and figure this out. So if we were going to do that, we would go ask Jesus, right? Okay, he's not here at the moment. So second best thing, we'd ask the disciples. They're not here at the moment. They left us the Bible, the New Testament. That's what we're talking about. That's what we want to study. Those are the little things, a few things in there that we are confused about maybe. Uh, did they leave any other writings? No, because if they did, it would be in the Bible, okay? Next best thing, how about someone who studied under Peter, Paul, James, knew Mary, knew Joseph, eyewitnesses not of Jesus but of the apostles? And actually, from the first century, we have quite a few uh, of those people. And they will give us um, uh, quite a few sermons. And if we look at those sermons, you can figure out what they teach. Much like if you didn't know anything about what uh, Pastor Xavier teaches or what Calvary Chapel teaches, you could sit here and listen if you had time or get copies of the CDs or the, the DVDs and take notes and listen to all the sermons. And you'd quickly find out what they believe about a rapture, about salvation, about these things. And so that's what I set out to do. And the church fathers are interesting because it pretty much put me right back to square one. Uh, the Bible says what it means and means what it says. And I uh, didn't really learn much of anything new after several years of study. But what I did know is uh, it's that simple. And we're going to talk about that today. Uh, this morning what we want to talk about is the scriptures in general. We're just going to look at the scriptures, nothing else. Uh, the, the second set, we're going to go back and talk about the early church fathers and see what they had to say about the scriptures and those type of things. And then in the third session, we're going to talk about the, the Gnostics. You might think, well, if the scriptures are correct, where did the uh, gospel of Thomas and Mary and uh, Judas and these things come from? So we're going to talk about that. In all of this, what I want us to understand is that the Holy Spirit dictated to over 40 people to write certain portions of the Bible. They were put together, and it's a complete uh, set of scriptures, set of books for us to live our lives by. Satan will want to tamper with those things, and of course the easiest way to do that is to create your own Bible. And it's interesting, when I went back, uh, I've, I'm a writer, I've written 22 books so far, I did a, a book specifically on this subject uh, called The Ancient Word of God. And I went back and looked at 200 different Bibles. And what was interesting to me is I looked from the 1400s up to uh, the 1800s. And there were about 20 Bibles made. You know, the King James, the Geneva Bible, uh, Whitcliffe, Tyndale, all those things. From the 1800s on up, uh, another 20 or 30 Bibles. In the 1900s, from 1901 to 2000, there were a little over 100 Bibles made, lots of different translations. What's interesting to note is when I wrote the book in 2012, it had only been 12 years on this side of the century. In the last 12 years, probably more now, there's been over 40 Bibles written. So with the advent of uh, being able to print your own books and sell your own books, a lot of people are beginning to do that. Now, let me start off by saying that you can pick up a King James, a New King James, an NIV, an NASB, or most of the other ones out there, and you're going to find out that most of the information is the same. The story about Jesus being born, dying on the cross, most of those things are going to be the same. You can get saved by reading any of those Bibles. You can understand basic morality. But what I thought was interesting and what I wanted to focus on is I, I love prophecy. And uh, we've had over 50 prophecies fulfilled by Israel since they've come back. That's in the last 60 years. The prophets uh, talk about the, the fact when Israel comes back, there would be two expulsions and two returns. 
The first return was in 536 BC, and the second return was in 1948. And it begins to talk about if you see the nations, or the Jews coming back from all the nations, or the second time, however it says it in scripture, then you know that whatever that passage is talking about, it's gonna be fulfilled sometime after 1948 AD. And there's been several. Israel was supposed to come back as one nation. They were supposed to come back to the ancient land of Canaan, not somewhere in Iraq or somewhere else. They were supposed to be founded under a man named after King David. They were supposed to re, uh, bring back, so to speak, the Hebrew language. Um, we could go on and on. There are a ton of prophecies that was supposed to happen and are. And this is an amazing thing that I think all the Muslims should pay attention to. I mean, their Quran says it was Allah's idea to have the Jews rule the land of Palestine. They're back, according to prophecy. I talked to one Muslim friend of mine, and I said, well, the prophecies are specific. And he said, well, yeah, that's because the United States is a Christian nation. Anyway, uh, and, and they made it happen. It's like, okay, let me ask you this. Do you think the United States is more powerful than Allah? Well, no. Well, then Allah let it happen. Well, yeah, okay, it's Allah's will. <laughs> he didn't like that. But anyway, we look at these things, and the prophecies are very, very important. And I started looking at some of these things. Uh, for instance, I had a Septuagint version, and I was going through the prophecies in, in Matthew, and Matthew specifically said one of them is that uh, he would be called a Nazarene. And that's a little confusing. On a lot of the prophecy charts, it's not listed there. I even saw one book that said, we don't know where this prophecy is at. It's no longer in scripture or it's gone or something. So I looked it up through the Apocrypha and all the other scrolls, couldn't find it either. And I finally went back and started looking at it. I have some friends that speak pretty good Hebrew and they always look at me like, just ask. I mean, come on. So that particular scripture, when it says that he will be called a Nazarene, is based off of Isaiah chapter 11 and one other passage where it talks about the Messiah will be called the branch of Jehovah. Now, one of the words for branch in Hebrew is Nazar. So if there is a city called Nazar and I'm from Nazar, that's my city. Anytime it's my something, you, you tack the, the sound E onto the end of a word. So Nazari. So somebody from the, the place called the branch would be called Nazari. And so Jesus was from the place of Nazareth, which is how you would say that in Hebrew. And anybody reading a Hebrew Bible would get it instantly. Me, I'm scratching my head. So anyway, that's an amazing prophecy, and that's an interesting one. But when I looked it up in the Septuagint, it doesn't say branch. It says flower. Well, branch, flower, bow, twig. I, it's a plant. You know, I can kind of understand that. But again, you see how changing one little word like that can make a difference, not in anything dealing with salvation, but prophecy. And it's very, very important. When I was studying the church fathers, they were talking about con uh, to uh, compartmentalize the prophecies. And any time Israel is coming back the second time or from all nations, that's going to be the, the second coming type prophecies. So all of those are from 1948 forward. Well, one of the major prophecies for that is in Isaiah 11, and it talks about when the Lord brings his children back the second time. Now, he brought them into the land of Canaan. They were expulsed the first time under Nebuchadnezzar, the 70-year captivity, and they came back in, 19, or in 536 BC. And then the Romans expulsed them in 132, completely dissolved the nation of Israel, and then brought them back, according to Micah's prophecy and others. And that happened in 1948. There's actually even prophecies embedded in Daniel that tell us the date that they were supposed to come back. And it was supposed to be 1948 on our calendar. And that's amazing to me because I keep running into people that are British Israelites that say that the Jews aren't really Jews, that we're the Jews. and well, there's a group of people that claim to be Jews that went back on the date prophesied and fulfilled 50 prophecies. My guess is they're the real ones. It's not hard. And everybody comes up with these weird ideas, and it's like, just go back to Scripture. Give it a chance. Assume that it's correct. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean there's something wrong with it. 
But uh, if you have a translation like that, it's, it's a little strange. And I begin to see that there are other translations that are kind of diff difficult. And so what I set out to do is pick several things from Scripture, specifically four Scriptures that I would look at and look at all these Bibles to kind of compare things. Uh, one of the things I noticed that I thought was interesting, now how many of you know what a, what a Christian denomination is compared to a cult? You know, a cult, usually we say, Usually we say something like a cult is something that hurts someone. And there are Christian churches that sometimes hurt people. But the ancient church said a cult is someone that changes their doctrine enough to where they're not Christian. In other words, if you follow my teachings and I'm a cult and you become a Johnsonite, you're going to die and you're going to wind up in hell thinking that you're going to heaven. A cult. And they basically boiled it down to uh, those groups that are non-Trinitarian. So if you say Jesus is the archangel Michael, or he was just a great guy, or he was a fairly okay rabbi, or he was a prophet, you know, Islam says that he was one of the greatest prophets next to Muhammad, but just a prophet. Okay, that's blasphemy. According to the Bible, you must believe Jesus is the son of God in order to be saved. So I was looking at that, and I knew there were a couple of cults that wrote their own Bibles, like Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons. So there's at least two out there made by cults. Well, I went through these 200 Bibles, and I thought it was really interesting to look at the non-Trinitarian or cultic Bibles. There's 38 of them. I thought that was really interesting. Um, there's the Mace New Testament put back at, all the way back in the 1700s. He was a Unitarian. I'll just go through this list. We probably don't have any of these because most of them are older. But there's the Wakefield New Testament, the New Testament Improved Version. The Joseph Smith translation, that's the Mormon one, one of the Morgan, Mormon ones. The emphatic diglot, that was a Christadelphian. The Noise New Testament. The Farrar Fenton Bible, that's a British Israelite, you know, Jews are not Jews. Uh, the Grieber New Testament, that's one that the, the, the uh, Jehovah Witnesses will quote occasionally and use him as a source because he translates 1 John 1.1 1, 1, that Jesus was a God, much like they do. Of course, he's a self-professed spiritist, and he got his translation from spirit guides. So I would think that's kind of weird, but anyway. Then, of course, the New World Translation, that's the Jehovah Witness Bible. The authentic New Testament, written by a non-Trinitarian group. A Holy Name Bible, not, there's a several of those now, but there's a specific one written back in 1963. And there's several others. There's the Bible in Living English. That was another Jehovah Witness translation. Didn't realize that there were two. Sacred Scriptures, Bethel Version. The original New Testament. I love these names. Yours is okay, but mine's the original. The Kingdom Interlinear Translation. I like interlinears because it gives you the Greek and the Hebrew and you can look up stuff a little closer. That one is a Jehovah Witness translation. Uh, Christian Community Bible, McCord's New Testament, the Clear Word Bible, that's Seventh-day Adventist, the Anointed Standard Version, that's a white supremacist Bible, by the way, the Scriptures, just the Scriptures, written by Witness Lee, Recovery Version, Last Day's New Testament, the Holy Scriptures Version, the Word of Yahweh, uh, the Source New Testament, this is interesting to me, the source New Testament. When I was studying this, I, I started writing books and I've done translations of Dead Sea Scrolls like Enoch and Jubilees. And there are a few other people on Amazon that have done similar translations. So I always kind of watch them to see sales and stuff like that, how the other guys are doing it. And the, the person that wrote this source New Testament, I thought it was interesting. She's one of these people that I keep watching and I didn't realize that. So I went back and studied her background. She served in a university for one semester helping put Phoenician pottery back together. You know how they, they dig them up and they, they're all cracked and broken and you try to figure them out and put them back together and see what they look like. So she did that for one semester and then claimed to be a expert in Phoenician language and culture. She got that from a broken dish, okay. Anyway, um, this isn't being televised, is it? No. Anyway, she went on and said, because of that now, we now know that there were some words in the New Testament Greek that we were a little confused about, 
Well, some of us might have been confused about. But anyway, and now we know for sure what they mean. So she's a self-professed Greek scholar because she looked at Phoenician pottery for a semester. Um, so it's interesting, I'm thinking, okay, what Greek trans words were we confused about? Where is she going with this? Well, she's egalitarian, of course, but more than that, she's pro-gay and lesbian. And their scriptures have been tweaked slightly because now we know better, which is interesting. So those are examples of what you get. Uh, there's the um, Renove, or Renove, or rather, Spiritual Formation Bible that's emergent. Also, the Life with God Study Bible is an emergent one. Uh, see if you can figure this one out. The Tarish Nephite Bible. Mor Mormon, yeah. The Voice, another emergent one. The Basora. The Victorious Gospel of Jesus Christ New Covenant Translation. That's a mouthful. That was done in 2008. Anyway, so those are a few examples. Now, we, we probably would be hard-pressed to find some of these, except maybe on Amazon, because they have a lot of older books. But any time that a Bible is put out by a known cult or a cultic group, uh, we don't want to have anything to do with it. So you need to check who the person was, what seminary they went to. Sometimes it's hard. You look at these things, and they'll say, like, well, he graduated with a doctorate in whatever from a well-known seminary. Well-known. If it's well known, why don't you tell me? What are you trying to hide? You know, and a lot of times the Seventh Day Adventists will do that. They'll put on seminars on Revelation and at a well known church at this address. Don't tell you the name of it. And these guys went to several, got several degrees from well known seminaries. I instantly start thinking it's a Seventh Day Adventist prophecy seminar. Okay, anyway, so those are a few examples of the cultic Bibles. But what I did is I went back and I wanted to look at scriptures and uh, kind of look at these and see how things went. So when we start out looking at this, I picked four verses to kind of look at things. And let me start out by saying I'm not a King James only person. I don't think that the King James, the old King James, was divinely inspired by God and used by Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, however, I am a pro-Hebrew, pro-Greek, Texas Receptus person. I think those Greek manuscripts are the best. That happens to be what the King James is based on, but you, when you listen to me, you listen to Xavier and other people, we're constantly saying now, in the Greek or in the Hebrew, it is, and we'll kind of explain it a little bit. That's because there's just no way to get a perfect translation from one language to another. Every language is different. So even if the King James was the absolute best translation ever, you'd still want to double check it with the originals. I was at a conference not long ago and I was standing next to Avi Lipkin and this guy comes over to him and uh, says, so what version of the Bible do you use, King James? You know, and he's like, no, the original. The original, where can I get a copy of that? The Tanakh, the Hebrew, I read it in Hebrew. I don't read it in English. You know, he's Jewish. But this guy was like, the original, What's, who, who put that one out? What's the author? So, but it's interesting, and that's where you would really want to go to, but to really be fluent in those things, you need to know the Hebrew, and Greek would be even tougher, because 2,000 years ago in Koine Greek, you know, all the idioms and, and things we have in language, you'd really have to live there for a while to know that you know it. And so I don't feel qualified to stand up and say one translation is better than another, based on how it translated something. But what I do feel qualified in saying is, if they're missing verses, there's something wrong. And people will say, well, you're assuming the point again. This Bible has so many verses, this Bible has a few less. Either this one cut some out of the original, or this one added something that shouldn't be there. Okay, that's true, that's, it's one or the other, that's true. How do we find out for sure? And it's actually very, very easy. Uh, in your Bible, sometimes you'll have uh, a missing verse and you'll go down at the footnote and it'll say, this text is missing in the oldest, most reliable manuscripts, okay? And nobody really ever lies to you. They just don't tell you the whole story. And what we're gonna be talking about in this session and the next one, uh, Basically, let me explain it to you this way. If, if we have a Bible 
like the King James that has all the verses in it, and then somebody digs up a, a, a script from, say, the, the 1100s, and it's missing a verse, and we decide that that's the better one, so we cut the verse out of ours. Then somebody digs up a 6th century Bible, and the verse is back in there. Okay, we put it back in there. Then we dig up a 3rd century Bible, and the verse is missing again. Okay, when well, we release it. So you can see how it depends on how far back you go. So if we go all the way back to the very earliest manuscripts and the verse is not there, that in itself would lead you to the conclusion it should not be there. Somebody must have added it, okay? But then if you, and that's what I keep telling other people to do, if you go back and you look at the early church fathers, and I don't care what they teach or anything, but do they ever quote 1 John or this verse? And how do they quote it? Is the entire verse there or is part of it missing? If they quote the longer form, then, I mean, how did they quote something that somebody added centuries later? You know, that's not possible. So when you go back and you look at the church fathers, the oldest manuscripts, by the way, that they're talking about is usually the Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. And those, if you've looked at them, and again, it just, you just have to look at them. Uh, there are tons of notes in the side, smudges, where whoever was making this thing uh, made a mistake, smudged it, put it back, made a mistake, put it back. Eventually, this thing was set aside because even if it was perfect, it's got smudges and it's been messed up and probably would have been thrown away, but not. Uh, our Septuagint that we currently have is based on the Codex Sinaiticus, the Greek Old Testament. Uh, the Church Fathers talk about the fact that uh, the first Greek New Testament was written by a man named Lucian, or Greek Old Testament, rather. Uh, Lucian's translation was supposed to be very, very accurate. But then there were other people that came along that were non-Trinitarians, they were cultists, that wanted to tweak certain scriptures, mainly cut out things dealing with the divinity of Christ. And so we have all of those. So. Knowing that and knowing history, if you go back and you look this up, you can look at it and see if the texts are there, if it's really messed up or not. Some passages are rock solid, others are very, very different from what we have in the Hebrew. And again, the same reason why Avi would have said, just read it in Hebrew rather than English, if you want to make sure, is the same thing we would say, why do you read a Greek when you could read the Hebrew? And if we're reading the Greek and there's three or four different versions, uh, that let, should let you know that something's not quite right. So let's look at a few of these things. And um, in Isaiah 7:14, we're just going to look at basically four scriptures and then talk about them. In Isaiah 7:14, it says this. I'm just reading out of the King James. Uh, Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God with us or God in human flesh. Now, this passage is specific. It's talking about the fact that a virgin would conceive. And it's amazing to me when you look at the prophecies, this will be quoted out of the scriptures uh, to prove the point of the virgin birth, for instance, and then it'll be dropped and they'll go on to another scripture. You come back here and you read the whole prophecy, there's several other parts to the prophecy, and that's always amazing. It talks about when he's 12 years old, certain kingdoms will be destroyed, and that was fulfilled four years before Jesus had his bar mitzvah. But anyway, this specific scripture says virgin. Now, in some of the translations, they will change this and say a young girl. Um, a virgin having a child would be a miracle. A young girl having a child is normal. Generally, very old women don't have children. So it usually is a young girl. Not necessarily a baby, but say 20 something is much younger than 50 something. So I'll show you a sign. There will be a man come in this church. Well, half of you are men, so that's, that's not a big sign. So you're kind of messing up the scripture here when you change it to young person, young girl, this type of thing. It could say maiden, that would be the same thing. Uh, like I'm saying, you could translate it a bunch of different ways. Uh, one of the things that some of the Jewish New Testaments will say, uh, and Old Testaments will say, is that it uses the word Alma, and Alma means 
young girl, usually a virgin, but not necessarily. If it meant to say virgin, it would say Bethula. And that's not exactly correct. It may be in modern Hebrew, but it's not correct for ancient Hebrew. In Joel chapter 1, verse 18, it talks about a virgin, and it uses the word Bethula, and it talks about how she bewails her new husband that went off and was killed in war. So it can be used for a virgin, a young person, or a bride, a newlywed. Newlyweds are generally not virgins. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But So this should always be translated virgin. That's one of the main hearts of fundamentalist Christianity, the virgin birth of Christ. So when we go to uh, Luke and we look at the story of how this was fulfilled, in Luke 1.27, uh, it says, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. So she was espoused, or in other words, engaged. Now we have an engagement, and it's a little different. I could get engaged and then decide I don't want to do this and just break off the engagement. I might even demand the ring back, and you probably wouldn't give it to me. But it's, it's all up to me. In the Hebrew culture, we first get espoused or betrothed, and it's an actual ceremony. We're technically legally bound, but we're not supposed to come together yet until the ketubah, the actual wedding ceremony for that night. So this was a person who wasn't just engaged, a promise ring or something like that. This, this, they were legally bound, but they weren't supposed to be sleeping together. She was not supposed to be pregnant. If she was found to be pregnant, she could be stoned to death. You know, and so this type of thing. So it's a serious thing. But she was a virgin. She was espoused to a man or betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, that's interesting because we come back. Uh, and, and if you read that whole story uh, about how Gabriel comes to Mary, you know, you can change the words around a little bit. But this is what I'm talking about, about the general stories. The angel comes and says, you're highly favored. You're going to be the mother of the Messiah. She says, I don't know how that would happen. I have, I'm not even officially married yet. I've never been with a man. How could I have a child? No, this is going to be a miracle. You're going to conceive through the power of the Holy Ghost, and it will be a virgin birth. Oh, okay. Well, be it done unto me whatever the Lord's will is. But that whole conversation shows that, yeah, no, I, I've never been married. I've never slept with anybody. It's not physically possible for me to have a child. Not right now. No, this is going to be a miracle. Oh, okay. And I'm thinking there's no way you could mistranslate this whole thing and get around that whole story. Oh, people are so inventive. Uh, there's one translation called the UPD version, updated version. Okay, not written by a cult. It's just a modern liberal translation. In verse 31, it says, it doesn't say that, how could this be, for I am a virgin, which is the whole story. It changes just that one little phrase. It calls her the wife as, instead of betrothed, but it changes this, and it says literally, we can't have children. What does that mean? If I said that my wife and I can't have children, what does that mean? Apparently, we've gotten married and we've tried for at least nine months or a while, and it's just not working. There's something medically wrong or something like that to say we can't have children. That doesn't, so they have ch changed the entire story around to get around the virgin birth. And we'll talk about what, because we know exactly what happened and who did this and when. We'll talk about that when we talk about the early church fathers. But it's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, when we get to Luke 2.33, well, actually, let me back up. That's what happens there. I just wanted to show you that one. That's Luke 1.27. Luke 2.33 says this in the King James and other TR-based Bibles. Joseph and the, his mother marveled at those things that were spoken of him. This is Jesus when he's 12 years old in the temple. And what they're saying here, Joseph and the child's mother. Some translations will say the, the child's mother and father. Joseph was not the father. It was a virgin birth. 
and people will say, well, it means um, legal guardian father. Well, it could be, but notice what it says when we get down to um, Uh, let me read you this. This is Luke uh, 2, 48 to 50. And this is when he was in the temple and they started to go and they lost him, remember? And so they go back and they find him in the temple. And when they, this would be G, uh, G, uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, and Joseph. When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why has you dealt this way with us? Behold, your father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said to them, how is it you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? He was very nicely saying, well, you know I'm supposed to be here, but you just called Joseph my father. I respect him, but I need to be about my father's business. And they basically said, don't you do this again. Fine, I'm gonna obey my parents or my mother but my mother and my father. That's why I'm in the temple. So we can see this in here, and the, the story from the scriptures, from the Greek, is very, very specific. You know, Jesus is virgin born, and we see that all the way through the scriptures. When you get something that says, well, we can't have children, or she was the wife of Joseph, those are cutting corners, and those are bad translations. We're getting away from those scriptures. Okay, another one I want to look at here is in Daniel chapter 9. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. But in Daniel chapter 9, uh, he's given a prophecy that the Messiah would be born and then be, would be cut off. And this is 70 weeks prophecy. And this is kind of important, again, for, for witnessing purposes and for prophecies. Daniel chapter 9, I'm going to read verses 25 and 26. It says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street will be built again, the wall and even in troublesome times. And after the three score and two weeks, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. The people of the Prince will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end thereof will be with a flood and to the end, the war of desolations are determined. Now, this is a prophecy that specifically says whenever the command to rebuild Jerusalem is issued, and that was March 14th, 444 BC, so many days later, the Messiah would be cut off. And if we had time, we'd look at that prophecy, and that was fulfilled to the day. There's three major date prophecies in Scripture that give you the exact day, and that was when Jesus was to die in 32 AD, when the Israelis were supposed to come back in 1948, and when they took back the Temple Mount in 1967. Again, I think the Israelis are the Israelis, my wild guess. But these are specific, and this is what he's talking about. And after the Messiah dies in 32, the people of a prince come and destroy the sanctuary, that was 70 AD, and then that starts wars and a skirmish with Bar Kokhba, which was uh, all the way up to 30, 130 AD, and then the Romans completely destroy it and get rid of all the Jews, and Israel ceases to exist in 132. And then sometime they come back, which is 1948, and then other things happen. But in here, sometimes you'll see this Messiah mentioned as chosen one, or anointed one, or a chosen leader. A chosen leader, that always confused me. It's anointed one literally the, and some, some people will say it's some chosen leader because it doesn't say ha-mashiach. And again, they're not lying to you, it doesn't say ha-mashiach. In Hebrew, you have an H tacked onto a word, it means the whatever, just like E on the end of a word is my whatever. So, but the one thing they don't tell you is there's a, there's a construct influence. It's a certain state in Hebrew. And basically, if I'm gonna say I ate the red delicious apple. Red and delicious describe apple. I'm talking about the apple. There's only one apple I'm interested in. That's the one that I ate. It is an apple among many apples, but when we're talking as subject, it has to be the subject. And so in Hebrew, what we'll do is string the words together. We'll have red 
with a little line, delicious with a little line, apple. You know that whole phrase is the subject every time we're strung together. So you can't translate it, a Messiah will come. Nobody will do that. Well, some people will, but you can't do that. It's just not proper. Um, it's just like the word I am when Jesus said I am. That's the name of God in Hebrew. Uh, you don't say I am without a subject. It's, it's bad grammar in English, Greek, and Hebrew. I am hungry. I am thirsty. I am Ken. I am, you're, you're waiting. You're what? You'd have to finish the sentence. So it's important here that this be translated the Messiah. It's the Messiah. All the old commentaries from the rabbis from in the BC time period refer to this as being the Messiah when he will come. After that time, it's, well, maybe it's an anointed person or whatever. And this is very, very important because this is actually the forbidden chapter. You're under a rabbinical curse if you read this and get out a calendar and try to figure out when the Messiah is going to come. Because it'll come out to AD 32. So the question remains, and, and even outside of that, after the Messiah comes and is cut off, then some prince comes and destroys the tabernacle, or I mean the, the temple. That happened in 70 AD. Okay, that's history. We all know that. Every Jew knows that very well. We want to rebuild the temple. So the question here remains then, if this is the case, um, either the Messiah came or he didn't come. Now, if he didn't come, why could that be? Well, God changed his mind, or the Jews were bad and, you know, God did something different. The thing about this is, if you look at it logically, God said, God's all-knowing, correct? Scripture says, I know the beginning from the end. I tell you what's going to happen before it happens. So here's God that knows everything. That's, and everybody agrees with that. That's Old Testament. So here's God saying, okay, I know you're going to mess up, and I'm going to get really ticked off at you, and I'm going to change my mind. So I'm not really going to send the Messiah, but I'm going to go ahead and send an angel to lie to the prophet Daniel, and he'll write it in the Bible, even though I know it's a lie. But that's okay. That doesn't make any sense. The Messiah came. Or Daniel is a false book and, does, and needs to be taken out of the canon. No Jew will say that. There's a prophecy that says, as time goes by, the Christian church becomes more and more apostate. And during that time period, Israel kind of wakes up. So as time goes by, when I talk to Gentiles, I'm going to be less and less effective. And as I talk to Jews, I'm going to be more and more effective. So I want to concentrate on these passages. If it wasn't Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about Roman Catholics or some sort of organized thing. The Messiah, the Messiah, everybody says it's not a chosen leader. If you read it in Hebrew, you know it's the Messiah. The Messiah came before Titus destroyed the temple. You have to accept that. And just talking to him about that, just stay away from the Old Testament, stick with, or stay away from the New Testament, stick with the Old Testament for a Jew. What do you make of that? Well, I don't know. Well, go think about it. Pray. Ask Hashem to reveal to you what this passage means. Well, the rabbis say we're not supposed to read it. Okay. In my play, in where I live, I'm a Christian. And when I go to church and my pastor says, don't bother reading the Bible, you'll get confused. Just pay attention to me. I leave that church. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the word cult? You know, it's like, I don't want to say the ancient rabbis were cultic, but any, I don't care who it is, somebody telling you not to read the Bible, there's got to be something wrong, you know. But anyway, this is another one that we have to look at. So understand, when you look at it with the construct state influence of Hebrew, it means the Messiah. The Messiah came before Titus destroyed the temple. There's no other way around it. So if you have a Bible that says a chosen leader, somebody's trying to tamper with stuff. Another one we have is, and this is kind of important, and we'll deal, touch on this a little bit later. Um, okay, just trying to make sure I'm not going over here. Um, in uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, you're probably familiar with that. It talks about God being manifested in the flesh when Jesus came. 
And basically, here, here's what it says in, in my translation. Um, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, pre preached on by the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now this is interesting because in Greek, in some of the older manuscripts, uh, there's a word that's who, and it's os. It's an O and then an S, okay? In the ancient manuscripts, what they would do a lot of times is abbreviate, just to conserve space. Words that happened all the time, like God is probably one of the number one words in the entire Old Testament. So that word is theos, T-H-E-O-S. They would drop out the O and the, and the E and just make it a TH, which is a circle, like an O with a line through it and an S, and they put a little line over the top of it. All abbreviations have a little line over the top. So when you see this in some ancient manuscripts, it'll be THS with a line. If it gets smudged, you can make out that it's probably an O-shaped and an S, and there might be a line here or there might have been a line here, but you're not sure. So it's either Theos, God, or it's who. So the modern translations keep trying to say this means who. So they will read it something like, um, great is the mystery of godliness, who was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, and seen of angels, etc. But that doesn't make any sense. Who is who? What are we talking about? Chapter 3 is all about bishops and deacons. And, and what bishops and deacons and your pastor should and should not be doing, how to judge if they're good or not. And then it ends by saying, make sure to run the church this way, period, we're done. And then it comes up with this verse, who was manifested in the flesh? Who, my pastor? What, what are we talking about? It doesn't make sense contextual-wise. But if we say, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifested in the flesh, Scene of angels. And then it goes on. I believe this actually is part of chapter four, because it goes on into chapter four and says we need to make sure to avoid the demonic doctrines. You know, that you can't eat meat and you have to be celibate in order to be holy. And if you're a good minister, you'll remind people of all of these things and point them out. Then your congregation will truly be holy and you'll be a good minister. Well, what all things, if we put all these together, that Jesus was God in the flesh, that at the end times, demons will attack that and also say that you have to be celibate and that you can't eat meat, have to be a vegetarian. So those are demonic doctrines that will come out in the end times. So your Bible should say in this particular place, God manifested in the flesh. Uh, the next one, that we want to look at, and you're probably familiar with this. This is 1 John 5, 7, and 8. And this is interesting, too. This is one, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but in 1 John 5, 7, and 8, it says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now what's going to happen is, this is an obvious Trinitarian type verse. And what's going to happen is they're going to cut out part of this, the middle part. So it will say, for there are three that bear record on, in heaven. Kind of cut that part out there and go down to, making my notes here. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. So they're going to cut out that middle section. So it doesn't talk about the Father, the Word, and the Spirit being one. That middle section is cut out. And again, all we want to know is, do the early church fathers and the old documents have that whole verse in there or not? What's interesting about it is, how many of you know if I say, I was talking to Bob and Jane, and she told me something? Okay, well, obviously the she is Jane, not Bob because I said she, and it has, my sentence structure has to agree in gender. And if I said I, I talked to Pastor Xavier by himself, and then I went and talked to a, a group of people from the Ministerial Association, and what I got was he said, well, that must be Pastor Xavier. 
what they said, well, that must be that group. Everything has to agree. In Greek, you have those, but you also have time, gender, uh, and several other things, and they have to agree in context. Certain words are masculine, feminine, and neuter, not necessarily. Uh, just what they're, what they're supposed to be. So in this particular verse, and one thing that nobody ever points out is, if you look at this, masculine and, and uh, singular, and all these things, the first part agrees, the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's a perfect sentence in, in the Greek. And the three that bear witness on the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, these three agree in one. That's a perfect sentence in Greek. If you cut the middle part out, it looks fine in, in English, but when you look at it, it does not agree. Some are neuter, some are feminine, some are masculine. So that these three agreeing points back to what? Not, those, that, not that group. So again, it's interesting, the people that know Greek and Hebrew ought to be able to pick up on this stuff. A lot of times we have Calvinism coming and saying things like, uh, um, uh, using scriptures like uh, in Ephesians where it talks about the um, we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. And they'll, they'll want to say, instead of we're saved by grace, which is through faith, not of ourselves, they'll want to say we're saved by grace through faith, and the faith is not of ourselves. It kind of changes the meaning a little bit. Well, when you go back and look up the tenses, you know exactly what it's referring to. So it does help us a little bit understanding that. And again, that's not something we can bring out in English. The language just doesn't have that kind of thing. Um, so there are several scriptures that I agree with on this. We go through, so we wanna look at those proof texts, the Isaiah for the virgin birth, the fact that Joseph was, his, uh, Joseph was there but was not his biological father. First Timothy 3.16, that God was manifested in the flesh and this particular scripture. Now when we come back, I'll start off here because we're, we're getting low on time, but I want to show several things about some of these scriptures. Well, I guess we have a minute or two. Let me just do this. Um, this particular scripture, uh, it, again, in a lot of the Bibles that will come out and say that this middle part of John 1, 7, or John 5, 7 and 8 rather, uh, is not in the oldest manuscripts. And again, it depends on how you look at these things. Again, if it's not in the older manuscripts, uh, there are some older Greek manuscripts dating from the fourth century, and they're not in some of them. But some of, the, some of these, the way that they do these things are amazing. There's like 5,000 and some odd manuscripts, and they'll say we don't have one Greek manuscript from the fourth century forward that has this verse in it. Okay, well, some of the questions that you need to ask is, out of those 5,000 manuscripts, how many of them have 1 John to begin with? There's about 20. Okay, how many of them have 1 John chapter 5? What we would call chapter 5. And where it goes all the way through, the line's not cut off at the bottom, that we can tell for sure that that is or is not in there. That's interesting. Is there one? We have 5,000, see that's the way they do this. Out of the 5,000 manuscripts, we don't have any that, that translates it like this. Out of the 5,000 manuscripts, how many have 1 John? How many have 1 John chapter five? So it's really interesting. What we do is we go back, when, when you have a question like that, in the first century there were other translations made translations done into Syriac and to Egyptian Coptic and to other languages. Not that we want those to be authoritative, but if we go back to any other manuscript translated in the first century, like Syriac, for instance, does it have those? You know, and first off, how many of those do we have? And so you have to keep looking at those. So there's actually several ancient manuscripts that have this in there. And you've got to realize that what the, the, the fathers or the translators of the, the King James Bible did, they took all of the best manuscripts. They knew about the Sinaiticus. They didn't know about the Vaticanus yet. But they rejected it as being garbled. Somebody was working on their translation skills when they made that one, so they set it aside. 
any time there was a question on something like that, they would go look at other scripts, other manuscripts. Let me give you an example. Now, a lot of people will say that maybe this was cut out from a, a non-Trinitarian, somebody that doesn't want you to think Jesus is God. There's 27 verses in the New Testament that talk about Jesus' divinity. So if we cut this one out, there'd be 26. If we took out that one we just read about God manifested in the flesh, that'd be 25. And so I think with the other 25, we could probably get the idea. So the doctrines aren't changed specifically, but for some reason, somebody wanted to take this out. And anciently, there was a group, we'll get into this a little bit later, but there was a group of oneness uh, people in the first century, second century, they were called Praxians. And they believed that Jesus was God, or was not God, that Jesus was the Father. And we have cultic groups like that today that are oneness that do that. But here's a quote, Tertullian, uh, mentions this, uh, talking against praxis specifically in A.D. 200. He says, the verse that talks about there being three in one in essence are not in person, as, I, as when Jesus said, I and my Father are one, but they're in respect of unity of substance, not in singularity of number. So he's talking to a oneness Pentecostal or a oneness type cult saying that you're confused. Jesus is not the Father. He did not pray to himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? It's talking about substance. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in substance. We're not one in the same person. When Jerome was translating the Vulgate, he said this, and I thought this was interesting. Uh, this is a prologue to the canonical epistles or the common epistles, the general epistles. So we've got uh, for, uh, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, those general epistles. He wrote this little commentary into his copy of the Vulgate. And he says this, this is Jerome, this would be about 500 AD or so. He says, the general epistles are not the same in the Greek church as they are in the Latin church. The general epistles may have or have been correctly understood and faithfully translated into Latin from the Greek in their entirety without any ambiguous or missing information, especially the verse about the unity of the Trinity found in 1 John. Unfaithful translators have created such a controversy by omitting the phrase Father, Word, and Spirit and leaving in the phrase water, blood, and Spirit which only serves to strengthen our faith and to show that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are of the same substance. Now, is there any question about which verse he's talking about? That's the one that we're talking about. I do not fear those who call me a corrupter of scriptures. I refuse to deny the truth of scripture to anyone who seeks it. And I thought that was interesting. So you put those two quotes together, basically in the Eastern church, the Praxians rose up, the oneness Pentecostals, not, I'm not saying anything bad about Pentecostals, but oneness groups that think that Jesus is God, there is no Holy Spirit, or that Jesus is the Father, rather, there is no Holy Spirit. That's, a, that's an ancient heresy. It rose up in the Eastern Church, and they thought, well, this is the one verse they're going to pick this, because they're going to read it like this. They're going to say... Um, these three agree and these three are one and the same person. They're going to read it like that. So to fix it, they're just going to cut that little part of that phrase out. And Jerome says, we're not going to do that. It sounds like an easy fix, but we are not going to tamper with Scripture. Now, today, if you look at the Eastern Church, you can go online and look up the, the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox Church, go to their website and look at their Bible. It's Greek, okay? But find 1 John 5, 7, and it's either going to be about this long. You don't have to even read Greek. It's, only, it's going to be about this long or it's going to be this long. The half of the verse or the full verse. And they currently have the full verse. So somebody took it out. Somebody got reprimanded. Somebody put it back. And so today, though, on a lot of our modern Bibles, they say that shouldn't be in there. It's not in the oldest manuscripts. Well, again, how are you counting the old manuscripts? Because I can show you several. Again, they're not lying. They're just looking 
strange. And this is just an attack of Satan on our Bible. So again, we want to have scriptures. We want to be able to look at them accurately, look at the Greek and Hebrew to double check, make sure the prophecies are accurate. You want to know the prophecies, don't you? You don't want to misunderstand any of those. You know that the word Hamas in Hebrew means violence? You know, there's many scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about violence, but there are two specific scriptures that talk about a group that rises up before the, before the day of the Lord comes that battles Israel. They're going to be called Hamas. They're going to be called violence. One of the scriptures talks about they rise up and their capital is in Gath of the Philistines. That's Gaza City. The prophecies are specific. And I, when I first realized that, I went to my friend and said, am I reading this right? And he's like, dude, you really need to start reading the Hebrew. <laughs> yes, that, we all know that. Yeah. I don't know what's wrong with you Americans. <laughs> it's like it says what it says. But it was new to me because I kept reading violence. But uh, again, so if you have a translation that maybe instead of saying violence made it, you know, evil, an uproot of evil, it would be correct, but you would miss part of those prophecies. So what I recommend to you is a good study Bible, a King James or a New King James. And I'm not qualified to tell you one of those is better than the other. I'm just qualified to let you know that there's no verses missing out of those two. Now, when we come back later, we're going to look at the early church fathers, and we're going to see why uh, I say that certain verses are missing rather than some other person in the Middle Ages putting them in. And it'll be really interesting to uh, see that. So for this, I just wanted you to know that the scriptures are accurate. Uh, there are fake translations in Greek that that some of the modern English Bibles are using. They're missing certain verses. There are corrupt Bibles put out by cults, put out by liberals. We don't want to be using those either. So we'll stop there at this point, So I think I'm running over, and uh, we'll come back later. Thank you.